Our scripture passage comes from Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 31. The day when the Son of Man is in his glory and calls all before him. Let's consider God's word. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and didn't minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is God's holy, inspired, infallible word. Let's pray. Lord, you have already spoken this morning to your people. Now would you also speak to our brother Aaron as he brings the word. Use him as your instrument, Lord, to proclaim the glorious truths of this gospel. Use him, Lord, and these scriptures that he's about to expound for us to awaken the dead, to raise the dead to life today. To turn our lives around and upside down, Lord, that everything we are and everything we have might be always and only for your glory and for you alone. Come have your way in our midst. We ask it in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. At the beginning of World War II, the German Air Force, known as the Luftwaffe, was greatly feared because they had become one of the most powerful air forces in the world. They were more technologically advanced and sophisticated, and many say had the best fighter pilots of that era. 
And America and their determination to level the air playing field over Europe developed what has become one of the most iconic and beloved planes of World War II history, the P-51 Mustang. And that plane had a supercharged engine, extra fuel capacity to reach further into the enemy territory, and a new wing design that had yet to be tested on any aircraft before it. And the man that they chose to fly it was Major James Howard the son of American Christian missionaries to China. And on one of his very first sorties, taking the plane out, yet untested, he became separated from his squadron of other aircraft and in the chaos of war actually stumbled across a returning squadron of B-17 bombers. Now, if you know anything about the B-17 known as the Flying Fortress, it is a slow, lumbering plane that carries a big payload, but it's pretty much defenseless doesn't maneuver well, it's not quick. And to his surprise, on the horizon as he watched the bombers returning from a strategic raid only 100 miles from Berlin, there was no air protection for them. And shortly after that, to his horror, some 30 of German's finest pilots descending from the clouds, moving in to attack the helpless bombers. James Howard was a man of conviction and beliefs that were demonstrated by his actions that he took next. He pushed the P-51 as fast as he could towards the battle, knowing that it would be a suicide mission. One American plane versus 30 of Germans' finest. The men that were in the bombers looked on, knowing that it was probably the end for them as well, because the B-17 had one of the shortest life expectancies of those of World War II in the airspace. Well, the story goes on. James dove and rolled and pushed his Mustang with everything it had in it, fighting with everything he knew. And to the unbelief of the bombers and the men watching as they fought that close to them, they witnessed him down plane after plane after plane after plane after plane plane, till finally six of them he destroyed on his own. And having run out of bullets, what did he do? Did he retreat? No, he did not retreat. He stayed as a man of conviction in the battle and actually used his plane to essentially bluff out, bluff the enemy, and they actually left. The bombers returned home. Upon his return, he was asked, why would you commit such an act of courage? I mean, especially when you ran out of bullets. And he simply said, I seen my duty and I done it. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. This sounds like a 1950s John Wayne movie. You know, you can just imagine him getting out of the plane and the, the, the camera zooms in on his face and you can just see him saying in the way that only John Wayne can, I seen my duty and I done it. <laughs> That's the best John Wayne I can do. <laughs> That's for you, Pop. Um, all of you under 45 have no idea who that is, but look it up. <laughs> but... You know, it's interesting because he was judged by the military, and he, he was actually the only pilot in the European air campaign to ever receive the highest military honor, which is the Medal of Honor. And the story that I told you is an absolutely true story. And the story I'm telling you today is an absolutely true story, except there, it has gr- far greater implications. That there is convictions and beliefs that are demonstrated by behaviors, and there is a judge who, who looks at that. But the consequences... The rewards, or lack thereof, are eternal. And we are talking about the end of all things as we know them, the last things. It's the return of Jesus Christ. And I realize that as soon as I say that, the topic of Jesus' return brings up all sorts of difference of opinions, of stories, of books, of, of, of endless debates, quite frankly. And I want to tell you before we move on that our denomination, our church, makes room for a variety of beliefs that you may hold. It is not ultimately the ultimate matter of salvation, okay? You need to know that. But I also want to stand up here and tell you that I don't think We always focus on the things we ought to that the Bible is telling us, and we get caught up in these other things. There are things we can know about the return of Jesus Christ, The Bible's very clear that some things will happen. It's clear that he will come. It's clear why he is coming. It is is clear what he will do when he does come. And there's other things that it just simply doesn't tell us. Um, It's always always staggered my imagination when I read Jesus' own words saying that it's not for man to know the hour. No man knows the hour, only God the Father. Not even the angels know 
when Jesus, and men of God will read that and they will think to themselves, you know what? I think I'll spend a significant portion of my life determining when Jesus will return. And the worst part is there's a lot of other people that get sucked up into that. And I'm not saying it's not intriguing. I'm just saying I think we missed the point. So my hope is by the end of this message, if I've done my job, you can be certain of what the Bible says about Jesus Christ's return and live in light of that. Verse 31, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. So let's talk about the nature of his coming. But before we do, let's make sure we're all on the same page. If you weren't here last week or if you were, what did Pastor Brent lead us in? He led us through the ascension, right? The ascension of Jesus Christ. Where did he go? He ascended to what? The right hand of the Father, the God Almighty, and he sits there in the place of honor and he is given the, the ability and the authority to judge. That's where, that's where he sits. So when we talk about in this series, as we study the Apostles' Creed, uh, my section, my line that I have the privilege of sharing with you is from there he comes to judge the living and the dead. From where does he come? In the old English, it's from whence he comes. He comes from the right hand of the Father as the king. That's where he's coming. That's what we're talking about. And every story we have had up to this point in the Apostles' Creed has been things that have happened in the past or things that maybe have present day implications. But now we're talking about the things yet to come. All right. Notice it says, when the Son of Man comes in glory, let me just tell you, if you don't know already, the Son of Man, that means, that is Jesus' favorite self-identifying name. It's what he's, when he talks about himself, he says, when the Son of Man. So Jesus is speaking of himself returning, okay? And what's clear so far is Jesus' is coming is imminent, it's visible, it will be in glory, and I will say it'll be overwhelming. It will be awesome. And we look to the apostle John who writing in Revelation, he says he's given a revelation, he's given an image where he says literally the heavens were opened up for him and he sees this image and I'm gonna read this image to you because this is what he saw and I want you to know when we read it, this is the event that it precedes, immediately precedes the return of Jesus Christ, okay? This is what he says, Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. And you know if you've read your Bible, every time... Someone comes in contact with an angel. What do they do? They just drop to the floor. Their life just leaves them, right? It's, it's not that the angel came to terrify them, but they're made in such glory and majesty that the, the human response is just, is just a fall to the ground in, in utter terror. And yet the angel comforts, fear not, be of good courage, right? But it's just the response. So I wanna tell you that can you imagine what it'll be like when Jesus returns? This is going to happen. It will be an awesome event. Unless you wonder, something else we can be sure of is that you will see the return of Christ. Okay, the Bible makes plain in several places, but Revelation 1-7 will suffice. And speaking of Jesus' returns, it says, every eye will see him. So you don't have to wonder, you know, you, you won't be in a coffee shop and, and Bob, who always sits at the same corner with the newspaper, is not gonna look and say, you know, something's going on in Australia, right? Some say it's the coming of Christ. Like, you, that's not gonna happen. You will know that Jesus Christ has returned. Everyone will know. Every eye will see. And when he came the first time, when Jesus came the first time, what did he come with? He came with humility. He came with meekness. He humbled himself. And it's the Jesus that we love. It's the Jesus of, of, of mercy, of compassion, of healing, of forgiveness, of sins. It's his whole mission. 
And that's the Jesus we love. That's the Jesus we often hear about. That's the Jesus we see through Bible studies. That's the pictures we see. It's the stories. It's, it's kind of often how we think about Jesus in our own heads and hearts. But we don't like this picture of Jesus, the one who comes to judge with a sword, with eyes like fire. Verse 32 tells us the reason for his coming. Listen to why he comes. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. Okay, it says all the nations will be gathered. That's Bible speak and in the original language for everyone everywhere. Everyone everywhere will be gathered together and he separates them. Why? Why Why will Jesus separate all of the humans? Tell me, because it's for the purpose of judgment. He is going to separate the sheep and the goats and if you know from reading your Bible, the sheep are always considered to be God's faithful, God's, God's people, right? And what are the goats? The goats are those that are not his people, those who oppose God. And this story might be interesting to us, but we lose a little something in our context because back in Bible days, they were very familiar with shepherds, sheep, and goats. And this is actually very graphic imagery. In the, in the Bible days, it was very common to allow the sheep and the, and the goats to, to graze freely in the day. But as the night, as the cold and the dark came, what the shepherd had to do is actually herd the goats together for warmth or they wouldn't survive the night. And so for the original audience hearing this, this was a terrifying form of symbolism of what, what Jesus is saying. He is coming to remove the goats, herd them together for what? The purpose of judgment. You know, we live in a day and age where... We often love the cross of Jesus, but we, we, kind of, we often despise the crown of Jesus. Now give, me the, give, me, give me the gentle Jesus. Don't give me the second coming Jesus. I mean, how often have you heard, don't judge me? It starts from the time my, my little kids are two years old. You're not the boss of me. Well, I am, but, you know, and it doesn't get any better. We grew up and say, hey, hey, man, do your thing. Just don't judge me. Okay, that, that's, that's the world we live in, the culture that we live in. Don't judge me. Who are you to judge me? Well, I have news. The Bible has news that there is a judge and he is coming for that very reason. And realize what's happening here, folks. Realize what's happening. There's no second chance. There's no pleading your case. There's no witnesses are called, no cunning, no strategy, no, well, let's investigate the facts here, Jesus. No, he comes with judgment in hand. The judgment's already made. It's done. He comes, judgment, he knows. He's separating the sheep and the goats. And listen, for the sheep, it is to be received with joy. It is not to be terrifying for the sheep. It might be overwhelming and awesome, but it says he comes with his reward in hand, okay? Okay. So for for those that are Christians, it is a comforting truth to be received with comfort as part of the good news of the gospel. But but let's look at the basis. What is the basis of why the sheep are accepted? We know he's coming to judge. We know he separates them. Why Why does he count them as sheep, as faithful to inherit the kingdom? He says in verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Now clearly this is not an exhaustive list of the, the five things you do, you do to get into heaven. It's representative of convictions that become behaviors that are demonstrable, okay? But when I read that, I'm immediately aware of all the good works I don't do, all the sins of commission, all the sins of omission, the things I do wrong, the things I don't do that I should do. And I have to confess, just the week of, of, of studying this passage, I, I was driving, I had, a, I had a, an unexpected phone call from some extended family members. They're not here, they're not watching. I won't get into details. But I have to tell you, as the conversation went on, it kind of hit me like a, a side truck, a Mack truck. As the conversation went on, I became more and more and more angry. And I literally had to pull over as this conversation went on. Went on. People were getting hurt by it. Uh, my anger was rising, so much to the point that I literally started shaking. And I started yelling. I started saying things I haven't said in years. It was like the Holy Spirit just said, hey, I'm hitting the eject button, Aaron, and you know, I'll come back when you get your act together. And, and the Holy Spirit moved out and the sailor moved in. And this is not who I am. This is not something I struggle with. This is not the way I talk. I just absolutely lost it. It's always amazing what happens when you go to preach, isn't it? The week before. You guys, if you love your pastors, really, 
pray for them. Like three days, the night before, you can't believe the things that happen. I, I'm gonna start keeping track of it. You, my wife knows. You cannot imagine the stuff that happens. But I, I couldn't handle it that day. The next day I woke up. I knew what I had to do. I humbled myself. I repented first to the Lord. And I actually said these, and I called those people and said, I, I, I'm asking for forgiveness, regardless of what you do with it. I wasn't wrong in being angry. I was wrong because I sinned in my anger. And you know, all I could think about when it happened was, this is what came to my mind immediately when I would stop shaking, is Matthew 12, 36. And, he's, and it came to me right away. It says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for what? For every careless word they speak, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. By every careless word I will be condemned? That doesn't give me a lot of hope. And so it's clear that Jesus, on the basis, what is he using for judgment? He's actually using works. We can't deny that. We ought not to try and explain that away. He is using works as a, as a basis of judgment. And you can see why so many religions over, over the years have made that the clarion call to salvation. What good works do you have? But this is a tricky part of the scripture today and one that warranted more study, and, that, and I did give it the study, but, but it's... It's often cited, this is the clarion citation for many people who want to say that the purpose of the church is to, so, uh, to be socially responsible to the maligned, the needy, the poor, that that's, the, that's, that's a true church. And also it's used as, as evidence-based, uh, works-based salvation. You know, you do the right works, you'll be saved. And I, let, let me say, to clear the air, if you call yourself a Christian and you have no good works, you, hit, you, you never have any care or compassion for those less fortunate than you, you're probably not a Christian. Okay, that's true. That's true. You, you, you ought to have some sort of changed life by the transformed, transformation of the gospel and the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, okay? But that's not exactly what's happening here. Um, we know that the Bible clearly says that we're saved by grace, right? Through faith, not of, not of yourself, not of works, that no man may boast, right? It's a gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Do we have it up there? Can we put it up there for him? Yeah, thank you. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God and, and not a result of works that no man may boast. And yet, if we know that, why is Jesus, why doesn't he say that? Why does he say what he says is based on these works? And wouldn't it be easier if he just said what, what Paul said for the basis of how we're judged, what Paul said in Romans 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved? I mean, I wish Jesus said that. That'd be a lot easier. So we have this tension here, and there's a deeper understanding in Matthew's words that we're gonna talk about just for a moment. Now pay attention, or you, if you miss this, you'll miss, you'll miss what's happening through the rest of this passage, okay? So let's move to verse 37. He says, then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. I mean, they're asking with genuineness, this is the basis of my salvation, a cup of water to a brother, visiting someone lonely. When did we do these things? They, they genuinely don't even know these good works that they supposedly did. And the phrase that's key, and it is often a debated phrase, you should know that, is my brothers. Who are my brothers? What does Jesus mean when he says, when you did it to one of the least of my brothers? And, and, and there's varying views, and it usually falls into four camps. People say it's, it was meant for the Jews. My brothers is, means the Jews. My brothers means Christians. Uh, my brothers means um, the apostles, or my brothers means missionaries. But after spending this, doing the study that I did uh, in the original languages and in the other gospels, and then most importantly, in the gospel of Matthew, where Jesus uses that term, my brothers, he means his disciples, he means Christians. His brothers are, are, are Christians, the disciples. And it's important that we know that because that's the key to understanding what's happening here in scripture. Listen to what one of the most respected theologians has to say regarding this. I'm gonna put that good. So it's a little long, but it sums it up. But by far, the best interpretation is that Jesus' brothers are his disciples. The fate of the nations will be determined by how they respond to Jesus' followers who, missionaries or not, are charged with spreading the gospel 
and doing so in the face of hunger, thirst, illness, and imprisonment. Good deeds done to Jesus' followers, even the least of them, are not only works of compassion and morality, which we admit that's needed, but they reflect, listen to this, but they reflect where people stand in relation to the kingdom and to Jesus himself. Jesus identifies himself with the fate of his followers and makes compassion for them equivalent to compassion for himself. Okay, so in its historical context, look what's happening here. Not in our day and age, but what's happening then is the disciples are sent out to take the message of the gospel, right? And as they take the message of the gospel, they travel by foot. Remember, the, the, the Bible days, there's no, there's no 7-Eleven. You don't, you don't get a, a smoothie or a Gatorade or a jug of water. There's no McDonald's on the way to Corinth. There's no hotels to stay in. And so you're largely dependent on those that you encounter and in sharing the gospel message, their response to you. So we don't have that today. We just get in our car and drive away. They don't want to hear about Jesus. But back then, like, they were dependent on the people. And so... What's happening is, is, what, is what's fitting in Matthew 10, 40. Listen to what it says, where Jesus says, whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. The judgment is based on what they do with the hearing of the gospel. That's the context. Let me, let me give you a personal example of my life. When I became a Christian, when I really became a Christian, um, I saw people that had lives full of joy and, and hope and just... You know, it's the awesomeness of people that really demonstrate know Jesus. And you know, when that started happening in my life, I would call up these brothers and say, hey, when can we get together? You know, hey, are we getting together? What can I bring? Um, sometimes I would call the office and say, hey, what does Pastor so-and-so like to drink? And is he there that day? I'm not gonna bother him. I just wanna, I just, I was, I just wanna bring him a coffee and the secretary would tell me and i just drop it off and leave. It, I was so, I was so thankful. I received them. I received them, I received the gospel, and it changed my life. And, and I wasn't doing those things to earn salvation. It's just a natural outflowing of, of how, how I responded to the gospel. Realize, Christian, that it's not huge accomplishments that Jesus uses to judge. I mean, look at the things he listed. A cup of water. Someone who's cold, bringing a meal like so many of you did when, when, when my wife had her surgery. These are the marks of Christianity, right? Of people who have received the gospel. Visiting someone in jail. Do you know that we have one of Jesus' sisters, one of your sisters, one of the members of our church that sat here for years that's in jail right now? Sit there for years in the back. Right now, here in Naples. Would you like to comfort her? Would you like to visit the lonely? Can you imagine the darkness of that place every day and every night? And if you do, come see me after church, and, and we'll, I'll try and make that happen, and I mean that. We have a sister right here that's in jail. It's one of our family. It's one of Jesus' family. It's the little things we do that we won't even remember, often that are the marks of the reception of the gospel. And for people like me that never feel like I can do enough, I mean, that, that, that's sometimes the message I need to hear, and I know some of you are out there as well, but now that's probably a sigh of relief for a lot of you. Oh, great, I've received the gospel, I'm good, right? Okay, good, he cleared it up, I don't have to do a bunch of works. <laughs> Not all of you, maybe at least one of you think that. <laughs> but I think we miss something if that's where we stop with it. If we stop there, oh, it's just the acceptance of the gospel and some little things, we miss one of the implications that Jesus has, one of the things that he, expectations he has for his people. If you're a disciple, if you're a sheep, it is his clear expectation that you are sharing the gospel with everyone everywhere. The mission that Jesus gave in Matthew 28 to go baptizing them and teaching them, right? That wasn't just, that was for everybody. That's for all of us. That's not just for pastors or, or or people in ministry. That's the mission he gave to all of us, to go to bring the message and the hope of the gospel to the world. And so, to reach the goats. And so here's the question I have for you, Christian. Here's the que question I have for myself. When's the last time you shared your faith with someone? And I'm not talking about, you know, 
that once in a million where the person comes up to you and says, man, my life's a wreck. I wish I had something to hope in. I wish I had whatever it is that you had. Like, those are the things we wish would happen. It never happens that way. Sometimes it does. But I'm saying, when is the last time you intentionally said, I don't care about the butterflies in my stomach? That man, that person owns that store. I did it just this week. Went in with the person that I, I know his first name. It just, a lot of people were there. I bought a product I didn't even want just so I could go in and talk to him. Just say, and all I said was, honestly, I, didn't, I, wasn't, I couldn't lay out the gospel. I just said, you should come to church Sunday. It's 9.30, it's Covenant Church. I actually had a conversation after that. I wanted to know a little more about it. I said, I've gotten out of the habit. I have a, you know, it was great. But Christian, that's my question for you. When's the last time Jesus is coming to judge the sheep and the goats? It's an eternal destiny. That's the work he gave us. That's his expectation for those that are his, That's why Covenant is such a missions-focused church and one of the reasons why I love it. So let's talk about judging the goats. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So what does he do? He, 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 he has separated the goats from the sheep and now he's judging them. And while the sheep represent the faithful of Christ, the goats represent those who have rejected Christ. And and folks, I know this is an uncomfortable message, but this is the Bible. This, This is what's in the Bible. And I have to tell you, there is a hell and people are going to it. There is a hell and people are going to it. Some people try to minimize it. They try and make the gospel say things it doesn't say, such as everyone will be saved, something we call universalism. It's completely untrue. It's not what the Bible says. It's certainly not what Jesus says. And questions come up, will there be a lake of fire? Will it be eternal blackness? What will it be like? Is it really as bad as they say it? Won't I just be there with my friends? Won't I just be there absent from from God and all the other Christians? No, no. Jesus himself says in Matthew 22 and 24 that it is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, of utter and outer darkness. Is is that metaphorical? Is it real? Here's what I know. Here's what I know. Jesus is trying to use the strongest language possible to represent the fact that it is a miserable place to go. I know we don't like that. I know our culture doesn't like that. People often say, I can't, how many times you heard this? I can't believe in a God who? I can't believe in a God that, and they go on, right? I've heard it. Listen, Jesus spoke about hell more than anyone else. You can take that to the bank. Jesus did. And you can't have a God of justice and holiness and love who doesn't judge Right, The world and our own lives have no end of wrongs committed against others and ourselves. I mean, we have wars, we have atrocities, we have governments starving their own people, let alone the things on the news every night around us. What kind of love is a love without judgment? That's not love. Sin deserves judgment, period. And don't think that the sheep get off without without paying for it. There's still a payment for the sheep, but you know what the difference is? Jesus Christ stood up and said, I'll go into battle. You're not gonna take my life. I'll freely give it for the sheep because I love them. Because I've gone to prepare a place for them. I want them to be with me in the Father. So your sin was still paid for. It was just on the shoulders and the agony of Jesus Christ. So the goats don't have that. But notice Jesus' words, it's not, he, well, he doesn't mention the murderers. He doesn't mention, you know, it's not the Adolf Hitlers only that go to hell. Look at the basis of the judgment of the goats. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. And naked, you did not clothe me. And he goes on and on. And what are the people, it's the same thing we just read. You can read it. People go on and say, when did we do these things? When did we not uh, give clothes and, and feed and, and drink to others? And he basically says, 
He answers them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me, and these will go away into what? Into eternal punishment, but the righteousness into eternal life. The wicked are not condemned for the greatest of atrocities, although they are. But that's not the example Jesus is using. He's using the very small, simple things. You didn't give a, a cup of water, you didn't visit someone in, 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 in jail, right? The simple actions that reveal what? If they have accepted or rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's... Paul, Paul nails it right here in Romans 2, 5. He says, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. They are condemned for their utter disbelief in the gospel and the natural simple actions that would validate that belief. One theologian puts it this way, Jesus is making clear it's not just the murderer who goes to hell, but the good people who occupy the pews of churches and serve on philanthropic boards. Therefore, when judgment comes, they're astonished. When did I, I have all these good works. You don't have the right works. So I know this is a hard teaching, guys. I, I, that's my job, though, to love you enough to tell you the truth, to tell myself the truth, to tell my family the truth. We must not flinch away from it. When Christ returns, he returns to judge. He will make all things right. He is on the throne. He is in control, and he is the judge. James Howard retired at the rank of Brigadier General of the United States Air Force. Has more medals than I, I can even count or name to you. He died on March 18th, 1995, just a couple hours from here, north of St. Petersburg, Florida. And as a son of Christian missionaries, it's my sincere hope that he is saved. I hope that I'll see him in heaven. But I don't know what he did with the gospel. I know his acts of courage and bravery, and they are to be commended. But I don't know what he did with the gospel. I'd like to think that he's saved as a son of missionaries. There's one who not only faced incredible odds and opposition going into battle, but by his own choice, lay down his life for the sheep. That's why Jesus Christ receives the highest honor at the place of the Father's right hand forever. That's why he's given the privilege to judge. You know, the Bible says that doesn't, God the Father doesn't even judge. All authority has been given to Jesus Christ to judge. And now you know why. The reality is no matter all the deeds of bravery, of good works, the basis of James Howard's eternity, the basis of my eternity, the basis of your eternity, the basis of every person you meet, the basis of their eternity is what they've done with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, if, if you're the sheep, go out and share the gospel with the goats. I mean, you, I'm gonna say it this way. You really have to hate someone not to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. I know it's hard, right? But let, let's be honest. Knowing what you know, knowing what I know, I have to really hate somebody. Not to be willing to share. I mean, we don't even get beat up. We ought to share the hope of Jesus Christ. What are we, why I say, I say this, everything I say to you guys, you're never gonna have me back, I know. Listen, everything I say to you, I say to myself, what are you doing, Aaron? You have to really hate someone not to share the hope of Jesus Christ with them. Return of Christ for you, brothers and sisters that are Christians, it's not to be feared. It's not, it'll be awesome, it'll be overwhelming, but it is not to be feared. It, 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 for you that are saved, it is to be feared for those who've rejected Christ, and we ought to do something about that. Some of you here, or even online, may not believe, or some of you here online may believe, but now you're not sure if you believe. We would have no greater joy than to talk to you about the hope that we found yeah, I know your life's a wreck. I know you're not perfect. Welcome to the club. You're a sinner like me. But we would love to share the hope and the joy. Come, come talk to us. Call the church if you're online. We have no greater joy than to do that. Come as you are. Jesus reigns at the right hand of the Father. And he comes in glory with his angels for the purpose of judgment. And the consequences are forever. Let's pray. God, we acknowledge that there are things in the Bible that we struggle with, things that we, if we're honest, we may not even like. But it's the word of God without error. 
and you have warned us, and you have given us all that we need for life and godliness, Lord, and you, I pray that you would make us a people on mission, Lord. Let us not be a people who want to have our best lives now, Lord. You come with your reward for those that are yours. Make us a people that are unsettled when we see our neighbors and the different people you've placed in all of our lives, God. And let us not get, up, get caught up with trivial things of the win and different things that may or may not have happened in history and realize you have told us to be a people to carry on the good news of Jesus Christ. We ask that you would give us the strength, the power by the Holy Spirit to do it, Lord. We give you thanks. Oh, Lord, come. We cannot wait. In Jesus' name, amen.